perhaps better if I share my screen? Uh, yeah, I'll have you do it. Uh, we'll do that just a second. That sounds like a plan. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to the third uh, installment of the COVID-19 uh, data series from Indiana University Libraries. This is a series of webinars related to COVID-19 data uh, to which IUB students, faculty, and staff have access. Each webinar focuses on a different type of data from a different vendor or collaborator. Knowledge of these data can be helpful for researchers who are starting new projects, um, as well as students understanding the changing nature of the market and industries in which they hope to work after graduation. And today we are joined by Joan Bizdorf, um, who is the academic account manager uh, for Indiana University from BCC Research, as well as Tim McLean, who is the director of content at BCC Research. And they are going to provide uh, in an, uh, both the cut, uh, an analysis of what BCC has in terms of data formats and other things, uh, particularly as related to COVID-19 and healthcare industries in general. And then also uh, Tim will be providing kind of an analysis um, and, and, and uh, a larger scope per uh, uh, perspective on how these reports uh, get made. So um, in the interest of uh, the chat will be open, but uh, make sure to kind of save your questions until probably the end, because uh, that can be kind of distracting to the presenter. But without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor over to John. Hey, um, let me start by sharing my screen of my slides. Give me a second. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joan. I'm the Aca Academic Account Manager for Indiana University. So beyond today's COVID data series, um, after the presentation, if anyone from IU has any questions about the use of the database, uh, please feel free to reach out directly to me. Uh, before going into the whole COVID data exploration, I'm going to start with a quick introduction of BCC research. Um, just 10 slides, a quick who, what, why of uh, BCC. Um, so starting with the WHO, uh, we are a US-based market research resource uh, based in the East Coast in Massachusetts, and we've been around for the past 50 years. We are about 30 minutes away from downtown Boston over here, um, surrounded by a very vibrant biotech and pharma ecosystem. So healthcare is definitely a core content of ours. Um, some of the content that we produce is also referred to by the corporate names that you may recognize, some of the big ones in the healthcare space, 3M, Merck, Siemens, Thermo Fisher, um, the existing members of ours. And um, healthcare aside, what else do we have? Um, really think of us more of uh, broadly as a STEM database. And uh, while we do have categories um, like number four that you see on consumer, um, number nine on food and beverage, we really explore these categories at a more B2B um, level rather than B2C. So if you're looking on reports on say, you know, pet products, um, groceries, lifestyle brands, chances are you're better, um, you know, you're better do refer to like databases like Mintel, uh, which I know you've had like previous uh, web webinar series. Um, but if you're looking for something like stem cell research, uh, water membranes, carbon capture technologies, definitely check out BCC. Um, why look at our reports? Uh, first of all, we have a highly qualified team of in-house analysts, uh, but we also pride ourselves in being able to tap into a network of heavyweight um, industry professionals. Um, people like Dr. Robert Eckhart that you see on the left, um, he used to review industrial technologies and systems for Fortune 500 uh, corporations, um, and so on and so forth. And on top of these professionals, of course, we have our our director of content, Tim, who is with us today. Um, he was for 10 years the managing editor of healthcare education. So he adds another layer of insight when it comes to life sciences, pharma, healthcare, biotech um, content. So you'll hear from him shortly. Um, we saved the best for the last. Um, that's it. That's the quick introduction. When you um, find BCC, 
basically you would find it in your um, libraries, uh, one of the A to Z uh, list of uh, databases. You would just click on it and you would just log in with your credentials. And um, I'm going to start by sharing, I'm going to share the next screen uh, where there is the live walkthrough of our database. So. Okay, so here we are after logging into um, the BCC research database through our use portal. This is what you'll see. Um, three things I would point out. Uh, first, just look at the just released section. Let me click on more to expand this. Um, this year, we have a goal to publish about 400 reports um, as compared to the 250 reports that we've been um, traditionally doing. So definitely check out our database often. And if your research interest sits at the intersection of business and STEM field, um, you probably find a lot of what you need in, in BCC research. Um, check out the end code of each product, um, of each report. Um, if it ends with an A, that is the first version of its kind. So you see it's largely ending with, with A. Um, B reports, reports that end with B, that's indicative of the second edition of its kind. And um, H would be the eighth edition of its kind. So um, we're not really focused on updating old reports unless there's really something significant um, that's happening in that field. Um, a lot of what we do, um, you know, it's new and it's exciting. And then the second tip I have to use this resource would be to search with a single keyword. So using this search tool, um, you know, instead of doing like COVID vaccines in the US, um, search with a single keyword, you know, so try um, COVID. And so you'll get over a thousand reports because recently our reports have started in including a section of um, the impact of COVID-19 in that particular industry. So this search result basically pulls out every report that has the keyword COVID in it. Um, let's click on COVID-19 diagnostics. So this is generally the format that you'll see for all our reports. It has a very intuitive um, chapter title by the site. Uh, always starts, of course, with chapter one. And there you can see who wrote the report. This is written by our in-house analyst team, the methodology that we use. Um, all these orange um, numbers are indicative of the number of times the keyword has appeared in that chapter. So COVID has appeared 30 times in this chapter one. Um, uh, well, in chapter one. Um, and then, you know, it breaks down. Um, it depends on the topic and, you know, how, how the report is broken down by type, by technology. It's a little different, of course, com you know, report to report. Uh, but generally, this is what you'll see. And then each report will end with a an end chapter on the companies that are involved in that space. So that would be helpful if you're trying to do some kind of competitive analysis. Um, always help to check, you know, what other players are in that space. Um, and then within that report, you could also check, um, do another search within this report. So let me try um, PCR. So then that would change. So if you do find a report that you think it's relevant to your research interests, you know, that's how you could further refine your search and, you know, try to tackle the chapters that would be uh, most relevant to your research interest. Um, you could also try to, by, by using one more keywords, but it depends on the frequency that the keywords are grouped together. So for example, no problems if you do a search on artificial intelligence or even AI. So you could just type artificial intelligence rather than just doing artificial. Um, and then you could do hospital supplies, for example. So here, you'll see that some of our reports end with this global market data um, end heading. And this is a new report format of its kind. Um, 
this is very much data heavy. So unlike previous reports that are more focused on the pros content, over here you'll get a lot of data um, in table forms and, and, uh, and charts. So helpful if you're trying to do some kind of data crunching meta analysis. Um, all these report, if you click on list of tables, you could selectively download the tables that you want and it would just be downloaded in an Excel file format and then you could you know, massage the data according to how you want to present it. Same thing for the list of figures. And in terms of the functionality of it, each report you'll get to download it. This one is by Excel because it's so data heavy, but for most of our reports, you could download by the full PDF version or selected um, chapters. Um, besides that, I would just show you the company index. Um, this is a repository of all the companies that have been featured in our reports. Um, you could do a search of uh, a company that you're trying to um, look for, like Apple, and the result would just pull all the reports that are relevant to you know, Apple, the company. Um, so you'll get 21 reports over here. Um, alternatively, if you have like a company name, you, you could also search BioNTech. two ends. And there you go. You'll have reports that, you know, mentions bio, BioNTech. Uh, but of course, like it would be a little different if you try to search Apple here, because then, you know, it's not directly indicative of, you know, Apple, the company, but just Apple as a keyword. Um, that's all. I think this platform is intuitive enough that you can't get lost in it. And if you ever do find that you need extra help, please feel free to hit on the live chat button over here. Um, this is manned by an actual person, like James is my colleague. It's not manned by a bot. So at any time you need extra support, you could reach out to someone in the company to, you know, help you immediately. And that's all for my introductory section. Thanks, Joan. Um, sure. Uh, I guess at this point, I'm gonna quickly pause and see if there's any questions for Joan before we move forward. Hi, Joan, I had a quick question. This is Bob Noel. Um, hey, Bob. I, so I launched it. I actually did do a search on artificial intelligence and got a white paper, the future of artificial intelligence. There's a big button then to download the white paper. Mm -hmm. I don't see it downloading. I wasn't sure if some of what is in BCC is available and other stuff is blocked, but, or if it's just, let me try it again. So I just threw in AI because I know like with artificial intelligence, we always, you know, have this bracket of AI. So I threw in AI and this is the result I get. Um, if I click on this artificial intelligence and cancer, I get this report that you could download with this button here. Okay. Um, here, I, I was going to put the report code in chat. Yeah, Joan, were you going to go over white papers? I thought I saw that at the end of your deck. Oh, yes, I could do that. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. We can skip ahead. So I just had trouble viewing it, but maybe it's just yeah. an error on my part. Okay. Well, let me know if you're further, you know, we could take this offline after the, after the webinar um, and I could do a walkthrough with you or, you know, try to troubleshoot it at your end. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, besides, yes, uh, I was reminded that besides our main content, we do have white papers. Um, these are these are fun reads. I mean, they, they are interesting and they often um, include like a section with an interview with uh, an industry professional, um, an inventor from, from that company or from that industry to provide some, some insights of you know, what's happening in this, these areas.
And besides white papers, we've got podcasts. So uh, we have weekly podcasts. Uh, okay, it'll take a while to load, but you could check out the podcasts that are um, that are of variable topics, and uh, you could get more information about that industry over there. Awesome. Um, so I guess um, if we'll uh, we'll kind of keep going here and then switch gears to Tim's presentation. And Tim, did you want me to bring up the slides, or did you want to bring up the slides? Uh, I'm going to give it a try, and if it fails, I want you to do it. Fair, for sure. Okay, how did that go? I don't see it. I think you have to hit the share, probably, because you probably have brought it up and then. Oh, right. Look at that. Okay. Is that any better? Yes, now we can see them. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm the director of content at BCC. Everything John said about me is true. I was in healthcare. I helped start a company called Quantia MD more than 12 years ago, which was the first uh, mobile online continuing medical education program for doctors in the United States. It's uh, now uh, WebMD. <clears throat> um, the intention here um, is to tell you how we do the research and then what a report actually is and how to use one. Um, then I'll finish with just a case study um, uh, proving what you can do with a, a bunch of these papers once you know how to use them. Um, the, idea is we basically publish in-house about 360 uh, full reports a year covering 25 technical verticals broken into five large categories. Uh, we also publish uh, one or two white papers a week. I write those. Uh, we do one podcast a week. Um, the white papers in the podcast, uh, the podcast is totally free and the white papers uh, are a nominal uh, price if you're not a member and free if you have a certain type of membership and it's a little bit complicated but it's all going to change we're going to try to give them away for free again as they should be but that's our publication that's what we do um, but the bread and butter of what we do are these full reports so that's what we should uh, be looking at uh, research methods are the same across all market research firms just to let you in on a secret it is a well-established uh, set of technical skills uh, that even if you work in a certain field, say molecular uh, uh, biology, you're not gonna know how to do uh, market research. Some of my contract analysts that work for me happen to work in the field, but also have happened to learn these skills. They are separate, they are not the same. Just because if you work in, a, in a, an area, you might have very valuable insights, but you're not doing the analysis correctly. So I'm just gonna briefly go over it because it's very boring and I apologize. So there's primary and secondary research and just like most things in the world, things are backwards. You do the secondary first and then you do the primary second. Uh, secondary research is also known as desk research. It is public information that you gather. You get it from the government, non-government organizations, the companies themselves, public facing websites, academic sources but no one else wants to spend that much time doing it. So that's part of it. Uh, you have to also organize it meticulously. Primary comes second, and that's original content, original thought and original research. It's picking up the phone that's going in person pre-COVID uh, that is interviewing not only just market leaders, but everywhere along the supply chain. Uh, so everywhere from uh, raw source materials all the way to the consumer end. That is where the original insight and thought comes into these papers, um, all of them. They would just be an information cull if they did not have this, and this is the hard part. Market sizing is its own science, and that is bottom up, meaning from the consumer end all the way up, and then top down, which is the opposite. And then you compare those two sets of data to make sure you're on the right track and don't have any gross anomalies, and how you do that is triangulation. And that is its own process. Uh, every 
everything that we research, every every market that we research in a report, the standard uh, is two or, or three historical years. You look at that data, uh, you look at the trend over that three years, and then you look at the, the last completed year where the books are done. So that would be 2020 uh, for a paper going on right now, say. And the change between the two and three historical years and the baseline year with factors, an easy one to think of would be COVID, but, but every factor that you can think of in that market is where you come up with your five year forecast. And the example down there is just what I said. The lingua franc of the of market research is the CAGR, the compound annual growth rate. The, the formula for it is right there, but um, it is, uh, the same across all market research companies. They all have CAGRs. That's what we talk in. That's what we speak in CAGRs. And there'll be more on that later. But to be totally shorthand, a CAGR is the growth rate. And anything over a five or a six is a significant, robust, healthy growth rate. Anything in double digits is alarming and, and good, uh, but showing a, a real sea change. Anything well over that is going to be an artifact, usually, not 100% of the time, but say 95% of the time, it's going to be an artifact that, that's not going to last. It's because of something. It's because of a disruption in the market, or it's because of a technological breakthrough, or a brand new patent, or uh, as is often the case in my old world in pharmaceutical, that means some drug went off of patent, and there is now a, an easier, cheaper version of it. Uh, so a full report, I'm not going to read this out, but you're looking at a giant document. And what I'm here to tell you is just don't be scared of it. It's 200 pages, but it can be 700 pages. It's 70 to 80,000 words, but it can be drastically more than that. It can be drastically shorter. It really has to do with what the paper is about, obviously. Uh, and as we went over, you can get that in Word. You can get that in PDF. You can get the Excel data if you want to play with it. Um, but it is all of these are the you know, the, the bread and butter of what's in each one. It is uh, historical and current forecast numbers is what I just went over. Uh, that's what probably most people use these for in the, um, in, in the uh, private sector. Uh, the background and analysis is probably what's used more often in the purely academic sector. Um, but it, as most things, it's going to be a gray area um, with different people using different parts of the reports for different reasons. Uh, and at the very end of it, there's a patent analysis and company profiles, which I'll go into a little bit. Um, so that's what each one is. It's a big document and different customers or consumers use different parts of it. And we kind of went over this already, um, so I'm not going to again, but th there's a typical uh, table of contents. And my point in bringing up this slide is all of our reports follow a very similar structure. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just say they all follow the same structure. Of course, they don't all follow the exact same structure, but it's pretty similar. And here's just a couple of useful chapters that are in every single one. So chapter two of every report is what I call the highlight reel. It is the big picture. It is, uh, I'd say 40% of our consumers only read chapter two. The rest of it is curiosity to them. And that is your marketing managers, your investment people, uh, some, somebody deciding whether or not their company should have a new branch and, 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 and branch out into this particular field. But the big picture is uh, this the, the graph down below. I did not cut and paste the, um, the footnote. Uh, those are in millions. So anything with a comma is a billion. Um, this is from... Uh, 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 genetic testing paper. Uh, but the CAGR is all the way on the right is your five-year forecast. That's what most people look at. The numbers leading up to those are the market sizes. So just because something has a large CAGR does not mean there's a huge amount of money in it. So that's important. Chapter three is the scientific background uh, that is universal in our reports. And that's where a lot of academic members get their, um, their bread and butter. Uh, but that's the tech landscape, the science behind it, explaining it, the history of it snapshot of the competitive and technological landscape, and then recent developments, mergers, acquisitions, and patents. Uh, this is a good way to, a lot of people will read chapter three before they read chapter two. So this is, uh, if you're not up to steam on something, this is how to get there. Chapter 11 is our other popular chapter, always at the end, and it's very ironically numbered if you think about it, and it is company profiles. And it's, we, we try to make them, um, not only as informative as possible, but we try to walk the razor's edge and, and make them informative, but, but only as they relate to the actual report that they're in. 
So for example, a big company like Apple that happens to be in a smart speaker report, we're not going to profile the whole company of Apple. We're going to profile how Apple applies speakers. Um, so all of the different company profiles uh, are housed in a central depot on BCC, so you, you can you can get at them, but they're going to be different for which paper they're going to be in. But it's still extremely helpful for research purposes, uh, for school projects. Um, it, it's helpful if you are approaching companies and, and, and want to get more information or more primary research than we did, or slightly different primary resource uh, research than we did. Uh, there will be contact information there, obviously, and um, you know some companies are open to it or some aren't. Uh, so. Good luck to you. Uh, so using these, um, here's an example. Uh, so COVID's impact on healthcare, uh, using one of our verticals, one yeah, membership is, is sold by, by vertical at BCC. Um, so just using the life science, which, um, which consists of cell biology, that's the bio, healthcare and wellness, that's EHLC, medical device and surgery, which is MDS, and PHM pretty much is obvious. So just in looking at seven reports since COVID in these areas, and that's by no means an exhaustive list, um, we've published hundreds since COVID. Uh, I, I took a broad, and I didn't spend a lot of time doing this, but I just took our data and took a broad sampling across healthcare with some insights, looking at what industries were going up dramatically by the CAGR. Then I did a case study on eye care, both optimal Ophthalmologists and ophthalmologists, uh, it, it's useful for us to lump them together, even though they're very different disciplines, obviously. Uh, but there's an interesting trend there we, we've seen since COVID. So that, I thought that was an interesting case study. The second case study is going to be on APIs. That's active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, so that is, uh, just for anyone that doesn't know, that's the actual medicine in your medicine. Everything else in your pill or your injection, but just for the sake of simplicity, call it a pill, Everything else in that pill that isn't actually, say, the ibuprofen that's going to help the, whatever is aching you is either a stabilizer, a, a, a coloring, a, a some sort of pH balancer. Um, and those are all, everything that isn't the medicine, those are called ex, excipients in pharmaceuticals. So that's everything that isn't the medicine. An accurate way to measure pharma is to measure only the active pharmaceutical ingredients. It's a more accurate way to see what uh, what's moving in the pharma industry. A lot of pills are heavy on the excipient and light on the actual medicine. Uh, not all the way to the placebo cliff, but pretty close. So, uh, well, like I said, so the first is going to be a broad sampling across healthcare. And that's what we're looking at here. The top kegger, as you can see, is 181%. So based on what I said earlier, you know that is not going to last. That is an artifact. Uh, and that is in the PPE, as you can see on the left there. So there's your face mask, boom, because of COVID. There's your hand glove, your booty, uh, your, your, all your protective equipment going to hospitals, but also to everyone else. It's, um, uh, you know, everyone is literally buying masks. And that's the only type of time you're going to see a kegger in the 100s, let alone damn near 200. Uh, so you, you know to discount that. If you didn't get in on that already as investor, you're not going to now. Um, over on the right are just insights uh, that we pulled from the paper and kind of rewrote uh, me and my head of um, life sciences. So uh, obviously telemedicine has gone up, but see that 18% CAGR? That means it's there to stay. That's a robust growth. But what's happening there is telemedicine was demanded during COVID. It was needed during COVID. And then what's, what's gone on is this wonderful line you can see in a graph. It's being accepted and realized that it's a better idea. Uh, we, 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 we can use telemedicine for many, not all, but many, many medical applications that we were going into the office traditionally for, for no reason, uh, because it was the way it was always done. That type of CAGR going on in a time of cholera like this, uh, uh, so to speak, that you can tell is something that's going to be adopted. Uh, and then ICU equipment, that 9%, the way you'd interpret that is just a healthy, robust growth that will probably come back down. Same with the 6% vaccine technologies, but that's totally understandable. Um, the, uh, the technologies is a funny word. So the, the biggest growth in a single technology in vaccine right now is synthetic mRNA. The other technologies aren't actually expanding. They're just pumping more money into the labs and building more labs with the same technologies, the same 
live attenuated um, the vaccines that we're, that we're used to, that we do every year because of the flu. Uh, but the, the, the reason for the relatively small growth there is because there's really only one technology in vaccines that's growing. And again, that's synthetic mRNA. Uh, the medical device technology in general, so this is a sweeping paper. This is one of our five, six, 700 page paper that cover everything that we deem to be a medical device. Uh, we exclude over the counter and we exclude in office uh, without a prescription type of devices and uh, everything else that you need to be documented on your EHR for having used or having asked for or being prescribed, that's a medical device. Um, anything to do with surgery, even down to social surgery is, is a medical device for us. Um, so there's your 4.8%, which is just steady growth, which is what you'd imagine it to be. Uh, so no huge COVID effect on that. Um, and then here's case study number one, which is again, what I call eye care. So that's both ophthalmology and optometry. So the first downward impacts you can totally see, people aren't going to offices. Uh, people aren't going to get surgeries because that takes place in an office. Uh, people are uncertain of their finances. Um, so, uh, and outlets aren't even open so in some places, obviously. Um, so all of these make sense. The two green hours were kind of the, the, not surprising, but surprising how dramatic the caregivers actually were. So e-retailing has come a long way in eyewear, but they answered the call. They made eye examinations and the ability to see different glasses and how they would look on you, uh, totally possible online. Uh, so both uh, ophthalmologists to do exams and optometrists to sell their glasses and vision care, uh, they've both, uh, you know, in online and at home stuff, they've skyrocketed. The second case study is a little bit more in depth. And again, that's the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, so there's short-term and long-term and I'm not gonna go through this because this is not your class project, but it was mine to show you what class project could be hammered out in just literally an hour or two of going through BCC reports. As long as you know how to go through BCC reports, um, it's, it's incredibly effective and you put something like this together. Um, so here are the uh, impacts on supply constraints, operational and logistic risks, all from papers culled in just a, a, a few moments. And then the regulatory risks, which are, you know, uh, huge um, as a result of COVID-19. And again, I, I can make this um, slide deck available to anybody who really wants to get into this, if you're actually interested in this. And then uh, supply chain di diversification, which is a huge, um, a huge problem where, where the raw stuff gets um, off track, off rail. And we've seen that in the United States. We had to have a, a uh, major football team owner fly in face masks at one point, if anybody remembers that, because the government could not do it. Um, and then here's what the government, uh, the policy and changes there, so speak of the devil. And what you get as an end result is price impact. And it's one thing to write a paragraph about it like this. It's another thing to actually show you the price increases. And again, this can be pulled from all our reports very easily. Um, this is every therapy class that are the big sellers, the ones that matter. But the only ones that make this list are the ones with a price increase that is dramatic. So only the smallest price increase was, you know, 19, I believe over here, but that's still, you know, that's 20% price jump. Some of these other price jumps are absolutely incredible. And of course, these are the active ingredients. So they're not the brain, uh, brand names that are downstream from that, but you can only imagine um, what vitamin A pill costs um, or uh, antimicrobials and antiviral things. Uh, obviously, this stands to reason. But the data in BCC is granular and uh, you, can, you can get it. And you don't have to be a data scientist to get it. I, I certainly am not. And I put this together again in, in, in just a couple of hours. Uh, let me exit this because that's the end of my... I, no, I'm not. I, well, I'm done and I'm trying to end my share. There it is. Uh, and that's it. So those were the four things I wanted to hit. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, 
I guess, uh, does anyone have any questions uh, at this point in terms of, um, in terms of what Tim just Nothing. I have a question. Um, that was really interesting, the increases in prices. Is that consumer increases or is that like B2B increases in terms of those, the pricing for pharma? Those are strictly B2B prices because again, those are active ingredients. That's before they get processed into a pill form, injection form, nasal spray, any kind of spray. Those are, those are the actual bulk medicines. So that would that process hasn't even reached the packaging lab yet, um, let alone distribution and then into retail settings. And then um, as another follow-up, how, how does, when, you're, when your analysts work on these reports, how do you differentiate between something that might just be a blip and something that is much, much more sustainable, right? When So when you write it and you try and project, because a lot of market research is an argument about the future, right? Yep. Um, so how do you decide between something that's just a blip and something that's really going to be sustainable? And like you yep. said, that, that change in industry. Yep. That's why there's not a machine that does this. That's why there's not, um, the, the, each analyst is, is, is uh, an expert in, a certain area or areas, and every piece of data is uh, backed up with an analysis. Now, now, we don't pretend to have a crystal ball, but we do have expert analysis. So treat us as risk mitigation uh, from an expert point of view. So one of the rules of thumb is one of that I mentioned, a CAGR that is, is beyond the pale. So something growing uh, over the past three historical years at like 5%, 8% growth. And then over the course of the base year, 2020 grew at 180% growth. Well, you, you, you know, it's not, you know, that's a blip. That's an artifact. Um, that's a, um, an anomaly. Um, but it's more complicated than that, that. That's putting together the, that's linking it to COVID. Okay. That's an easy one. Um, but if you looked at, um, Flip phones 15 years ago, they grew at Kagers of, you know, a thousand percent. If you're not making a flip phone, you, you've lost it. Well, that's because it was a blip. There was a, there was a technology right behind it waiting to disrupt it with a touch screen. Uh, there was just waiting there like a tiger in the woods. And then the, the, the thing just fell apart. No, literally no one makes a flip phone anymore, except for the very elderly um, market. And each analyst knows that. And when they present a Kager, there's always that it, it's in English, it's prose. Um, it is why this is this way, why this is uh, showing healthy, but steady growth, robust and fast growth. Uh, is this here to stay? Is this a blip? Is this a temporary thing? Why, what is it related to? Um, and then, you know, that's the, th that's actually the magic. If, if we just distributed data tables, um, you know, there'd be no, there, there'd be no uh, real value to it. Uh, there'd be a little bit of value to it, but, but someone who analyzes that field and, and more importantly, we try to keep our employees for as long as possible. An analyst who's been covering that field for many years is gonna be even better drawing those parallels between number and why, uh, story and data, uh, that type of thing. And then, um, oh, okay, I see in the chat too that they're figuring out something with those the white papers as well. Mm. Um, and but I did want to ask you, what if a student finds a report from like 2018, and they're yeah. writing a grant right now? How should a student uh, t how do, should how should they use that report um, if there isn't a newer report? Like, how do you train? How do you try and train? Right. <laughs> well, if there's a newer report, there's an easy answer to that. But if there's not a newer report, a 2018 paper is still going to go out to 2022. And it's only 2021 right now. Uh, so there's still value in that. Um, you know, uh, but the uh, first step is reaching out to BCC. I mean, one of the things that separate us from every other market research 
firm is that we do have an honest white glove concierge service. There is a human at the end of the chat box. Uh, there's another human behind that human, and that human is about 98% of the time me. And we will answer your questions honestly, schedule a new update if needed, uh, and if we have room in the editorial schedule, uh, we will at least consider writing a new paper, or we can put you in touch with the analyst that wrote that slightly older paper to see if they've been collecting data and staying on that field. Um, we can also see if the data that you're, and here's what happens a lot, that newer data that you're actually looking for is hiding in another report. We, we, might, not, we might not have elected to update that exact report, um, but it might be covered. If, if we didn't update the bariatric surgery since 2018, there's a good idea that I've folded in bariatric surgery into the larger medical device review we do every year that covers surgical devices. So there's no one that knows the reports like the people that work here because it's all we do. And we try to help our members find stuff that, um, like I've said a million times, nosology is the most dangerous science in the world. If you've got a bunch of data, a bunch of papers on, a different, uh, on different subjects, how do you categorize them the most effective way? And the answer is you can't, it's a fool's errand. Um, you can't, this used to happen in medicine. You've got a, uh, an 11 year old who comes in with a skin rash then ends up being melanoma. Okay, is that an oncology case, a pediatric case, a primary care physician visit? Or, you know, how do you, how do, how do you put that in the electronic medical record? The same thing goes with our library of publishing. Um, so just because something is a, uh, it's on um, slow release or rapid release liquid gels. Okay, is that a, a straight excipient paper? Is it a medical packaging uh, paper? Should it be under medical device? Uh, should it not? Should it be under healthcare? So sometimes when you don't find something, a student or one of our uh, uh, corporate members, it doesn't mean it's not there. But if it ends up being totally not there, we'll, t we'll tell you. We, if we've looked and we've uh, exhausted the whole thing, and we could just say, listen, it's not there. We just have uh, kind of older data to it. We can point you in the right direction, maybe to see if a, one of our partners has newer, and we can also consider redoing the paper or making an update for it. We try to publish collaboratively at BCC. Awesome, and I think Alyssa has a question for both presenters. Oh yeah, it's a it's a kind of general question, so if you can't answer, I, I completely understand. Um, I'm uh, I work at our reference desk here in the libraries, and you know, so this kind of stuff I try to keep apprised of, but as a role, as a um, more social sciences type of person, this sort of thing is a bit over my head of terms of what I usually manage. But it seems like now, you know, health data is becoming relevant to, to everyone suddenly. Um, and so I guess my question really was, what are ways that uh, lay, lay people like me could use um, these databases to our benefit? You know, whether that's you know, could we use it to keep up on certain trends or topics, or is it better if you have something specific in mind? Um, I guess I'm not coming around to the thread of the question here, but just basically, you know, I'm not, I don't have a research area within this topic, mm -hmm. but it seems like a lot of people are very interested in keeping up with this stuff anyway. And do you have any recommendations for how that might be done? Absolutely. Um, so we publish, um, you know, over-the-counter reviews every year of medical uh, devices. Uh, we publish uh, medical data reviews almost every year, and that, that includes personal health data, um, uh, medical data collection, and what's being done with it, and, and I, uh, uh, medical device data sharing, which is a perennial paper we do, um, and all these things I read just like you're talking about for my own curiosity. I mean, I kind of have to read them anyway, but um, it's a, a, a snapshot of what's coming in personal medical devices that you're probably not going to get anywhere else. Um, as a consumer, you, you kind of passively wait for um, advertisements to show you what's next in an Apple watch that monitors your oxygen saturation or something like that. Um, our papers tend to have, because of our patent analysis and because of uh, primary research and interviewing companies and profiling companies, we know what they're working on next. 
Um, so it's really just uh, selecting your consumer area. And in this case, your consumer area that you're talking about is, is health, consumer health and, and health data. Uh, so any of our papers on health data sharing, EHR, uh, medical wearable devices, artificial intelligence in uh, medical data sharing, um, any of those are going to have, you know, you're looking for that sweet spot, that chapter two and chapter three, and then the companies with uh, what's coming next is going to be in that chapter 11. So I'm actually glad I highlighted those three for your, for your question. Um, and, and, you know, it's better to come to BCC even with a personal health data question with um, a little bit more specificity in mind, you're gonna find the stuff a little bit quicker. Uh, I tend to read the medical device and health information sharing papers, almost like they were a catalog, but a big, big catalog, a big J. Crew catalog of what's coming next in terms of your own health data. Um, I hope that answers your question, but the, 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 your question is even more profound to BCC when it expands past healthcare. Uh, just because we do cons we co we cover consumer electronics, consumer goods of all kinds, um, uh, wellness, um, things like probiotics and 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 uh, functional foods and things like that, where um, synthetic meat, not just plant based meat, but actually synthetic meat, the meat they're growing out of almost nothing. Um, we're on top of it and uh, barely any of it's on the shelf yet. There's the impossible burger and stuff like that, but there's stuff in our papers that I've read for the past year that as a food consumer and a health food person, I'm like, Oh my God, I know what's coming in the next five years. It's not even on the shelf yet, but I know the direction it's heading and I know what that's are going to be. Uh, same thing's true for health data and the health in general. That's really helpful. Thank you. Other other questions that people have? I know there's one. There's got to be one. There's got to be one more. Hmm. Yeah. Um, while well, while people are kind of ruminating on this, um, I wanted to make sure to tell everyone about next week's. Um, IU uh, Libraries COVID-19 Data Series, the last in the sequence, which is with Regan Streif Institute. Um, so this one hour webinar will cover COVID-19 related data related to I, uh, available to IU students. Um, founded in 1969, Regan Streif Institute is a national and global leader in medical research and innovation dedicated to the information that empowers people to end disease. Um, Katie Allen, the program manager of the Regan Streif Institute Data Corps, will be discussing the COVID-19 registry, which is currently in the validation and testing phase of an inst inst instigator-facing tool. Uh, so that will include some of their healthcare-related data, um, which will probably relate quite a bit to what we've talked about today, because um, so this will be more the hospital's data, and which relates, obviously, to a lot of what BCC looks at in terms of their healthcare markets, right? Um, kind of two sides of the same coin. So any any other questions that people have? Well, um, I just want to thank both of our presenters, um, uh, Joan and Tim. Um, Joan, it was great getting a uh, a, a great view into the product. Um, I appreciate that a lot, I think. You're welcome. Um, and Tim, I, I love hearing about how um, market researchers uh, and what, what people think about when they create these reports, because um, I, as a business librarian, often have to explain what had went on in the people's heads. Um, and so if they can't find the exact report, this sort of breakdown of how you guys think about it is really helpful for helping that student um, you know, triangulate which chapters or what pieces uh, to use. Yeah, because um, yeah, because obviously, you know, like you said, it's a real human who made this report, right? Um, yeah. So for sure. Um, yes, and I see that people are writing in the chat. Great tool, insightful to know about how we can point this to scholars. So um, thank you both. Um, I'm going to gift you guys your 
seven minutes of time here. Um, we, uh, I will put this on YouTube as well as um, I have the slides for both the presenters. So I'll, pass, I'll uh, send those things out after the webinar, but thanks again for everybody for coming um, uh, and have a great rest of your, of your Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you.